Pastor Mai, and welcome to this week's edition of Agenda. I'm Phil Gorn. Politics? Been there. Done that. Got the t-shirt. This week, four experienced political commentators share their thoughts with us on what they think the top election issues will be, how Covid might impact on and after the election, and what the key election issues should be. I'm joined by Member of the Legislative Council, Kerry Sharp, former MHKs Hazel Hannan and Eddie Tier, and Alistair Ramsey, a journalist and political commentator. Well, I think the major issue for the Isle of Man and for the world in general is climate change. And I think that's got to be addressed as one of the major issues. I mean, we are really um, out of control and unless there's some huge spending with regard to um, capturing, I think is the word, doing a lot more than we have been doing on that. And I'm not just talking about it, but I think that's one of the major issues, I think, um, nationally and um, locally, I think it's um, it's sewerage. We have a quite a well, it's more than quite a big problem. It is a big problem in Peel sewerage at the moment. Um, yeah, yeah, Peel is the the land that Iris forgot, isn't it? Uh, oh, it is. It is indeed. Well, but yeah, those are the, I think the two big areas. Okay, uh, Kerry, what what would you say are the, the, the issues that candidates are going to raise to you when they they're with you when when they nominate you to well I've been looking at um, some of the manifestos that have gone out um, recently and what I'm seeing from candidates are mostly are health and social care um, the economy um, and housing. Those are the three that I keep seeing coming up. And, and, and any particular elements of that that you think are, 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 are the key? Because, I mean, the, 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 as three of us in, in the room know, having canvassed for the, a Keys election, it's very easy to, to say worthy things like uh, health and the economy and housing are, are vitally important and I'm right behind it. Does anyone get any further than that, or, or is there any detail coming through? Well, um, I haven't seen the detail yet as such, but I think on the doorstep, obviously, I would be asking, well, well what, you know, what, what do you mean? What kind of uh, improvements would you like to see in health and social care, and how do you think that improvements can be made? I mean, I think um, going forward, without a doubt, uh, there has to be um, more investment made in health and social care. Uh, I mean, um, in, in the independent report that um, was carried out, uh, there was a, a, a clear warning from Sir Jonathan Michael that if you want improved health service, you're going to have to pay for it, you know. So we've got to find the money from somewhere. Um, uh, in terms of the economy, uh, I mean, going back to what Hazel was just saying, um, I think, uh, obviously, you've got to concentrate on the economy because that's what pays for stuff. Um, but it would be, I think ideal if we could somehow weave in our our green strategies when we look at the future of the economy you know why shouldn't the art of man be the greenest place to live in britain for example why shouldn't it be the healthiest place to live in britain you you won't find me arguing with against that um alistair uh, you have you got a top three uh, doorstop challenges that um, uh, you think are going to come yeah in your direction? Pr- pretty much the same as uh, everyone else really and i think there's a tendency in Manx elections for people kind of to re- repeat what they've heard other people saying. So what are you talking about? Well, it's climate change and so on. And as you suggest, without actually elaborating a, a clear position on it, but I think climate change, housing and the economy are going to be up there, really. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The economy is certainly post-Covid mm-hmm. and post-Brexit. Yeah. Um, and, and obviously climate change has, has really taken on um, a, a much greater uh, profile in, in the last uh, few weeks even with, with all mm. the uh, rather tragic um, weather events that seem mm. to be happening at the moment and of course uh, some very interesting reports coming out from uh, the, the team of UK scientists uh, as well. Um, Eddie, I asked you for three and you gave me five um, earlier so uh, I, not, not a good start for a treasury No, are you saying I can't count or I've lost the ability, <laughs> Phil? You're probably right in that case. He's more generous but, than uh, he used to be. Yeah. Maybe I've lost my um, frugal habits, put it like that. <laughs> but I think really it depends who you're talking to. 
Um, it is age bias. I certainly agree with Hazel, Kerry and Alistair um, what the broad thrust will be, but the emphasis on what particularly interests them will be the age of the person you're talking to. That will be the, the determinant factor. So, for example, if you're talking to the older person, it'll be health. Uh, when can I see the doctors? Um, uh, there's a two-year waiting list for elective surgery at Nobles. When can I... Uh, what about my pensions? Uh, how secure are they? Uh, and what's the mechanism for reviewing those pensions? And then it, it'll go on after that to um, housing, green issues... So it'll it'll depend on the age of the person you're talking to. That's that's my view. I certainly found that found that way when I was um, out knocking on doors the last time ten years ago. Yeah, every, every, uh, again, it's uh, anyone who's never stood for the keys. I, I I strongly recommend it. Even if you don't get elected, just the experience of going out and talking to um, thousands of people and finding out what people actually think on the land. It's, it's a fantastic. Uh, a fantastic thing to do. One thing that we've not raised, uh, and I wonder whether this could have an infl influence, certainly an impact on, on the uh, forthcoming election, is is what's happened with COVID. Um, you know, I think up until perhaps the end of June, uh, people were generally quite supportive. They thought that the government was doing a good job, but uh, then we've had a, a complete sort of uh, move from total protection to not very much protection it would appear certainly to the layman is that going to impact on the election i know kerry you you had some thoughts on that yeah um you asked me what i thought the three main election issues were going to be on the doorstep and uh and i gave you the three i thought but added to that i think that the current policy on uh, on covid will be the number one thing that people will be talking about and it will be um has the government made the right decision over this summer period? I really think that that's what um, candidates are going to be asked. And of course, it could influence the general election, um, depending on the numbers. It certainly there was a certain feeling that it did affect the local authority um, election, and there was a, a, a definite gap there in how local authorities were. Uh, elections were treated and how the general election is, is going to be treated with lack of action um, on um, by uh, government and, and by the House of Keys to um, allow a, a free and a fair election for the local authorities but they've looked after it for themselves. And of course Hazel uh, you, you've just got, got fought an election and, mm -hmm. and successfully elected uh, to appeal commissioners. How, I, presume, I mean because of the timescales, there wasn't a lot of time to go out canvassing, but presumably um, people's concerns about COVID will have impacted on, on the ability of candidates to canvass. Oh, yes, yes. And, and like Eddie, you know, I mean, it's 15 years. Yeah, 15 years since um, since I canvassed before, although I did stand um, five years ago, but really at the, at the, not the last minute, but I mean, it was... I didn't get a chance to do that many um, that much canvassing last time, but this time the um, the, the concerns of people um, are many and varied. Obviously, um, it's local, so it's, it's so it's not keys, but they want the people that have canvassed want to know ab about what's happening generally, and um, yes, COVID was a was a a big concern, and some people weren't going out to to vote simply because of the danger of mixing with lots of people. And that could happen. It depends on the numbers, of course. Um, I think it's nine weeks now. So, and Eddie, I mean, you see, you, you, you're a man who's knocked on plenty of doors over the years. Um, as, a, as a candidate, you'd be quite nervous of doing, uh, of perhaps uh, going around knocking on doors when um, there's a lot of COVID about. Um, and and I, I imagine that some people won't want to see candidates uh, because of this. No, they won't, especially if you're canvassing during the daytime. The people you tend to find at home are the older mm -hmm. members of the, of the community. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if they're, if they're reluctant. Um, but I have to say, in normal circumstances, the people are very, very kind to you. You know, they, they say, come in, have a cup of tea, sit down. And uh, as the day is wearing on, that's a, a very welcome invitation. 
whether you get back out again in 10 minutes is another thing. <laughs> yes, but, I, 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 I got lost in running one day, I must say. I think I've managed to get around three houses. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's a, mm. as I say, great, great experience. It is. Um, mm. um, but, uh, Alistair, do, do you think that um, perhaps people haven't fully realised just how big an impact COVID is going to have uh, it, in terms of the future policy direction of the Isle of Man government? Um, or, or maybe... maybe it appears as though it's going to be a big influence, but uh, perhaps it won't be as big in uh, uh, maybe a year's time. It'll just seem as though it was a uh, thing to be forgotten about. I, th- I think there will, there's bound to be a, a pretty huge legacy from it. And the, one of the other interesting questions is, it seems that the public are very kind of restless and confused at the moment, having been quite solidly behind what was happening. Mm. There's, mm. there's a kind of, there's a kind of lack of communication. Mm. Yeah. Mm. If it doesn't settle down in those remaining few weeks, the question is how does that affect people's actual voting behaviour? Would they be more inclined to vote against the incumbents? Um, because there is a, people are kind of anxious in, in, in a, a way I have not really experienced before. And perhaps um, over the course of the next uh, couple of months. Uh, th- people will start to get used to what the, the next version of new normal mm. and uh, perhaps by election time this will this will not be the the big yeah. issue that it appears to be at the moment it's it's always difficult to know um and trying to judge uh, public mood is, is not always the easiest of things to do but but so i think i i think what we we mustn't forget either the mental health uh, the impact that COVID's mm. had on mental health yeah. and that's i think that's going to last for for a long time uh, um can I just say my experience of of uh, residential homes? Um, Southlands is now closed, and I think most government um, um, houses are closed. And um, the elderly people not having contact with people generally, and not able to go out, I think is it's so sad. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and and because that's because government have let things go. Yeah, it's um, been it's been difficult, but I think um, I, I, it was always going to be difficult moving from, you know, this policy of of elimination to just you know l- living with COVID. But to me, I think there's a big gap at the moment, and mm. it was always going to be difficult moving from one to the other. Yes, it's true, and it'll take a couple of months for people to get used to it. But <laughs> to me. There is this gap there. I mean, we've got the um, the public health messaging, you know, hands, face, space, you know, yeah, that's fine. But personally, I was really, I found it a really difficult day on Friday last week in Timwald in approving this latest set of regulations because it did feel that if we were relaxing the borders, we should be putting in mitigations, either mandatory mitigations mm. or really strongly worded mitigation saying right if you're going to a supermarket if you're going to a cinema if you're going you know anywhere inside you should wear a mask you know we want people to wear masks and I think the majority of people would wear them um and and the argument that came up was well it's very difficult to police you know you can't turn shopkeepers into into people who are policing mask wearers but I think from what we saw during the first lockdown the majority of the public would do the right thing to protect other people. Yep. So I, I really feel there's been a gap there um, and that there should have been much stronger messaging around, you know, wear a mask if you're in, in an enclosed space. Well, if everyone's wearing a mask, it really does cut down transmission. And all right, everybody's going to catch it eventually, probably, but you can slow that tie down. And I think that's where the fear is at the moment. People are fearful because they feel it's it's ripping through the community you know which it is yeah 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 it's almost like the using a zoo analogy the uh, the lions have always been kept in in, in, a, in an enclosure which mm. you're allowed to look into with lots of signs up saying danger don't don't jump into the lion's enclosure and then suddenly we're being told that actually it's okay to walk amongst the lions but you, you, know, um, you, you maybe you need to learn <laughs> to bring a gun with you or something. Yeah. you know yeah it's, it's a strange one listening to Kerry Sharp MLC, former MHK's Hazel Hannan and Eddie Tia, and Alistair Ramsey. Well, we think we know what uh, will be the, uh, the main doorstep issues, but uh, what should be the main doorstep issues? And that's um, a subtly different um, question, I suppose, but, but quite an important one, because 
time and time again uh, people get elected into, into Keys and Tinwald and find themselves with a whole raft of, of proposals that they feel are really important and then get landed with the reality which is perhaps uh, different to, to what they'd expected. Uh, on this one, Eddie, you managed to get three out of three as opposed to five, so uh, I'll give you the first crack at this. Well, maybe I was more focused on this one, but um, firstly, um, we have to generate the income uh, to provide the services. You know, it's chicken and egg. So um, how do we grow the economy? Now, I know that um, the government have just commissioned KPMG to do a report on it, but with respect to them, shouldn't that have been done within the first six months of coming into office rather than just leaving it until the fag end of the administration? And why do you think that would have happened? Um, why, why would it have been left for five years before they would do this? Well, it's d d difficult to tell. Um, maybe they were absolutely confident in what the Bell administration had done, but they weren't <laughs> so confident in what they'd done. <laughs> I, I think really um, growing the economy, but in the meantime, we need to prioritise the services. Uh, I used to get badgered by backbenchers and also by council colleagues for, we need to fund this. So my stock answer was, what do we take out of the budget? Because we can't spend the same pound twice because that's the reality that the Treasury Minister has. Mm. You know, I have to deliver, Treasury Minister has to deliver a balanced budget. There's no ifs, no buts, get on with it. Uh, but um, it would be much easier if the next administration and the next House sat down and if they all agreed the prioritisation of services and then the money flow would follow that prioritisation. Um, now, there should be serial-based accounting or serial-based budgeting. So, in other words, you go through and you take everything out and start again with a blank sheet of paper. And that really should happen when you're prioritising services. What is essential, what is nice to have, let's just concentrate on the essential and make the difficult decisions. Um, there's two words in this English language. There's yes and no. And politicians in the main like to use the yes word. Now, um, I never worried about using the no word because as long as you explain to people why you couldn't do something, they may not agree with you, but at least they would understand why you were taking a certain course of action. So, in other words, they're all interlinked, generating the income, prioritising the services, and then that will enable them to set the budget and the rebalancing that has to be done because they've projected that in 2022 to 2023 there will be an £18 million shortfall and that's before any interest to be paid on this new bond. So it's going to be a lot more than £18 million. So how do you deal with that? Okay. Um, and Alistair, have you got any particular top um, uh, favourites that should be uh, doorstep, uh, doorstep issues? Well, I, I, issues? I think the other guests have touched on this, especially Kerry, but this question of the funding of the future of health and social care. Um, this current administration have done well, I think, to put the structure of Manx Care in place, but they have conspicuously avoided the issue of how you fund it all in the future. And um, the Michael report on, on Manx Care in the future made it clear that there would be a funding gap for these services rising to about 120 million a year in 15 years' time. And he made it clear that you've got a choice. You either restrict access to free health and social care services, you either increase taxes, or you massively cut spending in other parts of government. Now, that just hasn't been on the agenda in the last five years, and no candidates so far have been talking about it, which is understandable because for a politician, you know, <laughs> those, are, those are pretty tough choices. And 120 million, just putting that into context, um, the total expenditure of, of Isle of Man government this year is what? Just over a billion, 1.1. 1. 1. Yeah, 1.1. 1. 1. Well, I mean, so the, that's, the, a, that's a big, a big, <laughs> a big yeah, amount yeah, to find then. Yeah, the figure that stuck in my mind was that that was half as much again on top of, roughly on top of the current mm. health and social care budget. I think that's a fundamental issue. And then around tax, the traditional um, constraint on the Isle of Man was that we, in the past, we've had to keep taxes low to attract business as an offshore centre. So there's always been a perceived limit to how much we can put the taxes up. Again, 
these issues haven't really been talked about. If you were standing again uh, for MHK for Peel and, and Glenn Faber now, um, would what, what, what would your top three uh, uh, priority items be? Uh, well, I think um, to be able to cost a lot, um, a lot of what people want, uh, I think um, I would be talking about increases in taxes. Uh, uh, I, I would be uh, talking about uh, income tax increases uh, because I think that's what, how we've, where we've got to go. And to a certain extent, uh, the international community is pushing us in that direction, aren't they? Uh, yeah, of course, the, of the course. Zero, uh, yes. being pushed out. Yeah, but I think we've got to be realistic that, you know, people's ability to pay, uh, I, I think, has got to be um, addressed um, it might not make that much difference to the actual income. You know, uh, income tax doesn't bring in an awful lot. But I think we've got to bring it home to people that everything that we want has to be paid for. And you've only got to th look at, uh, let's go back to sewerage. The actual amount that each household pays for sewerage is, is you know, very large. Uh, you're paying for water and sewage treatment and all the rest of that. It's the same with um, with refuse. They're all add-on costs. They're not income tax. They don't take into account the ability to pay. And I have always been, um, my position has always been, it's got to be the ability to pay for these for these items. But we've recognised that the difficulties that the public has with these ongoing payments that are being brought in by government or government agencies. And I think that's one of the big things. If it was all down to income tax, then I think government would recognise these added costs with their pass which they're, they're passing on. I think the other thing that I would talk about um, uh, would be um, the area plan. As we know, the area plan is um, west and north. One of the th things that people feel really strongly about in in the west is um, development and um, about how houses are sold and who they're sold to and then you know people coming in from outside and buying them so that the costs of housing are going up people can no longer ordinary people doing ordinary jobs can no longer afford to live here Kerry uh, what what would your what do you think the top priorities should be as opposed to what they what they may well turn out being in, in, in uh, on, on the election time well I was interested by what Eddie had to say about this image of the blank piece of paper um, and and this is something that really appeals to me as, as a former TV director uh, you know you, you you start with a blank piece of paper you you have a vision of what you want to achieve and then you start to create and then you eventually make it happen and um, I think that, um, as he says, it should be all about looking at everything that needs to be done and then deciding where are the priorities. And I think um, I get the feeling, although you know I've only been around sort of within Timwell for the last three years, but the, the overall impression I get is that for too long there's been an awful lot of focus on um, finance and finance sector, for example. I mean, yes, you do obviously have to grow the economy. Yes, of course you do. But, you know, you can bet everyone knows that we're up to date with money val and everything else because we've got to satisfy all these international obligations. But if you ask people, well, how many of our kids are leaving school with five GCSEs or uh, how many of our looked after children are leaving school with any GCSEs nobody would be able to tell you because actually that hasn't been on people's radars and I think that um, for me what would be important and a really big priority would be early help so for example at the moment government runs an early help scheme and only health and social care and education put money into that pot for early help even though um, it's run through children and families and uh, they have the data to prove that it's actually working. It's working really well. You get in early <coughs> with families and you really make a difference to those people's lives. Well, actually, to me, all departments should be putting money in. Uh, th there should be a cross-departmental venture because it's all to do with the future. And if you're investing in children now then you are saving an awful lot of money down the line in terms of your hospital bills 
uh, everything else, you know. So and, and for perhaps me, perhaps that that leads us on, and we, uh, but, but we, but we'll come to this later. Uh, it leads us on to talking about single legal entity uh, for government, because I think again most people don't realise that government is a series of competing legal entities that uh, don't always see eye to eye with with each other. So uh, yeah, but, but I think we'll talk about that uh, later. I'm talking to Kerry Sharp, MLC, former MHKs Hazel Hannan and Eddie Tier, and political analyst and journalist Alistair Ramsey. In this extended part of Agenda, we hear about 010, we hear about government bureaucracy and preschool education. I know, Eddie, um, uh, 010 uh, was something that you were a very strong defender of. Um, clearly, the... the that the international sort of tax situation has moved on. Interestingly, one of the things that the chief minister said when he was uh, when he announced that he was going to step down uh, at the election was um, that zero ten was the most important thing that the next chief minister would have to deal with. It's quite a, a strange thing to say when you think that the vast majority of people living on the island would think actually I don't even know what it means. Right, so that's my clue to explain it. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> Phil. If you like. <laughs> no, ba- ba- basically, the basic rate of tax on corporate profits on the Isle of Man, regardless of whether it's a local business or um, a business from outside the island who are operating through the island, is nil. That's where the zero comes in. Uh, the ten percent is on. Um, in effect, finance sector companies which need a license from the FSA, um, for example, banks, they're, they're the key players. Uh, so that's where the zero ten comes in. Um, during the last twelve months, when I was the Treasury Minister, I did ask the Assessor of Income Tax to scope out a replacement for the zero ten. So um, she's she was one of the stars. I got a very high opinion of her. And um, I would suspect that she will have proposals certainly on the shelf. But with the new uh, pr- uh, proposals with the G20, um, I, it's going to mean now that there'll be what they call a positive rate of tax. So there will be a tax charge. Now, from my point of view, that might be an opportunity for us because as long as we can get double taxation agreements with other countries throughout the world, we had eight, 18, I think it was, when I left, as long as we can get those DTAs in place, then from the beneficial owner's point of view, the shareholder's point of view, they can offset any tax that they pay in the Isle of Man against their tax bill that they pay to their own tax authorities. So it wouldn't cost them any more money, but we would get the money in the Isle of Man so uh, th- it might be an opportunity, but it'll take a better brain than mine to work it out. And, and one of the, the, the obvious things, I suppose, when we're talking about taxation, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably more on, on Hazel's side than, 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 uh, than, than I sometimes might have appeared. Um, <laughs> the, you know, I, I believe that uh, people will pay if, if they know they're going to get good yeah. services. But there is another side to this, isn't there? And, and uh, certainly Chris Robertshaw was was the o- obvious um, mouthpiece for the idea of, uh, of, of smaller, smarter government. Um, but but actually, you know, you, perhaps, I, perhaps I, I should have noticed more when I was in the House of Keys, but certainly having been outside of the House of Keys now for five years... You, you think, goodness me, there's another layer of bureaucracy being introduced here and another layer of oh. bureaucracy and so on and yeah. so forth. Yeah. I mean, climate okay. change is a great example. Yeah. You know, we, mm-hmm. we've, we've created the bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. We still haven't got the, the funds going out to help anyone, but we've got uh, the bureaucracy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think yeah. a good case of that is the road traffic legislation for HGVs. Now, uh, the, the root of this was an unfortunate accident where a wheel came off a lorry and uh, it killed an individual. really was unfortunate. But um, I always resisted when I was the Treasury Minister signing off the RTLC proposals because the vehicle which was involved in the accident had been checked the day before. Um, And uh, a check is only confirming that it meets the specification on the day and the time is checked. Nothing more than that. 
but it brought in a terrific amount of bureaucracy. Now, I'm a director of a company, a local company. We operate HGVs, and um, we had to apply to the RTLC. Fine, no problem about that. Paid the fee to the RTLC. But then they came back and said, you've got to prove to us that you've got planning permission for where you actually keep the vehicles overnight. So the vehicles are kept on an industrial estate. Right? It costs us over a thousand pound in fees to get specific plan approval. We had to actually designate it, designate on the curtilage of the property where we were going to park the vehicles overnight. Now that to me was not bringing any value. And what was in their remit to ask for details of the planning consent? Surely it was just the vehicles that they were looking at that the vehicles were safe and the vehicles were roadworthy. And, and does this um, possibly move us on to another issue in terms of uh, the way in which Timwald and government in, interact? Uh, you know, the, 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 I mean, it's, I suppose it's almost inevitable, particularly in the age we live with social media, that um, blame culture is, 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 is quite strong. It, it, I mean, it probably always was there in Timwald, but it appears to have got stronger over the years. Um, and when people know, <coughs> certainly civil servants know, that they're going to be blamed if something goes wrong, they're, they're going to want to wrap up the, the whole system uh, you know, as, as tightly as they can to try and make sure that no mistakes are possible. And of course, by doing that, then we, we get these added costs and added uh, bureaucracy. Am, am I, have I got a, any takers over on that side of the, the studio? I, I think some of that is... Um an outcome of the political process and then the politicians mm. complain about the product so that you know new regulations are introduced because of a select committee report you've got scrutiny constantly looking at what's gone wrong and you're building all these layers on so I think actually ultimately it's a, a product of political activity the civil servants get the blame for it but I think you know just going back to the point Eddie, Eddie raised about RTLCs um, the thing the thing um, that might be um, um, vehicles, but then you've only got to look at um, motorhomes. motorhomes, that's the word. They park all over the place. Nobody's got to provide anywhere to, for them to park. They are left on the, the roads. Um, they're, you know, just park anywhere and, and everywhere. And I'm not just getting at them, but um, there's, you know, there's all sorts of other vehicles that are um, left parked indiscriminately people um driving for for companies they'll bring the vehicles home and they they're just left um in the street and so there seems to be absolutely no control really over some of these um these bigger ve vehicles and and maybe once after the um RTLC have licensed these vehicles um they might never park where the planning has been um, described. All you've got to do is say this is where they're going to park, mm, exactly. and um, you know they mm. they might be round the streets then. So so it's not it's not straightforward. And I can just comment on um, children's children's services. I'm not sure whether it was um, ten years ago or somewhere like that that um, uh, preschool was um, was finished as we knew it. And that made such a difference to children's lives um, and, and parents' lives. Not only that, but also schools. And for it to change um, from how it started off is, to my mind, is a sin. Um, and what do you mean by that? I mean, what, in what way was, it, uh, was that a bad thing then? Because these, these people complain, people with a bit around them, um, complained that they their children weren't being treated the same and they they weren't able to go to these um, these preschool units, but the preschool units were brought in not for people who could afford to pay or you know whatever, it was it was deprived areas it was areas that had difficulties, and that's that's where where they were centred, and um, you know the work that they did first the first one was Jerby. The second one was was um, Paul Rose, and a head teacher there said said to me, "It was wonderful now that children going into school, they were able to um, concentrate. That you know that they 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 weren't you know they were 
prepared to be learning because prior to that they'd had one or two years where they'd learned through play and you know that's how it should be you know um for children i mean it was organized through play but it was i mean the 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 advisor that advised on it developed developed um the program for these schools and uh, the children could do exactly what they wanted but at the end of the day they had to come they had to sit quietly and they had to listen to all the children telling them what they'd done um during the morning where they'd played and and i mean you know for for a four three and four year old to do that you know i i think it's a wonderful experience that i think we all might have learned from well i'm i hate to do this because i've I've been really enjoying this i hope i hope the listener has as well um but i I think we've probably reached a a point where on the one hand we're saying big picture stuff like zero ten and the economy uh, and how we're going to finance the future and covid um you know these are big issues and yet on the other hand uh, the things that matter a lot to people are things like education, healthcare, uh, pensions, uh, all, all these things. So, uh, who'd be an MHK? That's all from tonight's programme. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. There'll be more from Kerry Sharp, Hazel Hannan, Eddie Tia and Alistair Ramsey in a future programme. I'm keen to represent your views on the show, so please get in touch if you have any ideas for our future agendas. But for now, Guru Mayu, thanks for listening.